All right, so let's begin, friends. So I sent you a text, which we're going to look at in a moment, some Hebrew text. Let me tell you the background. So this Shabbos is the Shabbos before Purim. It's a special Shabbos. We take out a Sefer Torah. And in fact, it's the first, the first of four special Shabbosim that begin this Shabbos and take us all the way to Pesach. Not every Shabbos, but four special Shabbosim. This is called Shabbos Parsha Zohar, the Shabbos when we read the Parsha to remember. What's the story? The Torah commands us in two places. In Parsha's Beshalach in the book of Exodus, and then repeated again in Parsha's Kiseitze in the book of Devarim. To remember, never forget what Amalek did to you. What's the story? When the Yidden left Egypt triumphantly, the whole world was in awe. But there was one tribe led by Amalek who attacked the Jews nonetheless, knowing full well that he would be, he would be defeated. But what he succeeded in doing was to to cool the ardor and respect that the nations of the world had. Ah, they're not, they're vulnerable. They can be attacked. And in fact, he captured one maidservant. Our sages compare Amalek to the following. It was a hot bath that nobody wanted to enter because it was too hot. One fellow came, he jumps in, got burned, but subsequently cooled it off and others could follow. So we're going to explore a little bit what Amalek is, and, and most notably and particularly spiritually. So the Torah says, remember what Amalek did, never forget. And moreover, God swears, we're gonna read the text in a moment, that my name, is not complete, and my throne is not complete until Amalek is utterly destroyed and all that is associated with him. A perpetual war against Amalek until the end of exile, until Mashiach comes. So the Torah commands, remember, there's two aspects to it, actually three. A, remember, B, don't forget. C, physically eradicate it. Now, C, physically eradicate, we cannot do because we cannot identify who exactly is Amalek and who is not. It stands to reason, and there are many indications of this, that the Nazis were the descendants of Amalek. Amalek harbors this irrational, it's more than hatred. It's absolute intolerance of the existence of the Jew. I don't know if you're aware of this. I'm not going to it now because it will take up the whole class, but the Nuremberg trials, in the end, they hung. Okay, we'll leave this for Purim. An amazing, amazing thing. I have to show you inside the text, and it, it's mind-blowing, but I don't, I don't I want to do justice to it, so we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it separately. So we are to remember never to forget. So the sages therefore said, once a year, we will fulfill that mitzvah with a public reading. The public reading of that very part of the Torah we are, where we are commanded to remember not to forget. So they chose the Shabbos before Purim. Why this Shabbos of all the Shabbos of the year? Because Haman was a direct descendant of Amalek. Hence, this is the appropriate time to remember what Amalek did. Haman sought the, the final solution to the Jewish problem. He was the first to come up with this, with this, but there's no words to describe the, the, the notion of the wholesale destruction of an entire people on one day. The Nazis could have done it in the one day they would have, but it just takes time. He was the first, he was a Molik. And so therefore, this is the Shabbos, the Shabbos before Purim 
is the Shabbos to remember this mitzvah. Moreover, moreover, not only is Haman in the story of Purim a descendant of Amalek, but it's not a part of the story. King Saul, many years later, we're talking, I'm sorry, hundreds of years before the story of Purim, the first Jewish king, King Saul, Shaul Melech, the second one was his son in law, King David. So, King Saul, we read the story in the Torah. King Saul was commanded by the prophet Samuel to wage war against the Amale Amalekites, which he did successfully. And he captured them all. And the commandment is to utterly destroy them. But uh, scripture tells us that King Saul had pity and he spared Agag, the, the king. And he left some of the choice animals alive, which he was going to bring as an offering to God. So the, the prophet Samuel comes and he hears the bleeding of the sheep. What is this? And he sees that Agag is still alive. Samuel himself slays Agag, but it's too late. Samuel, the prophet, says to King Saul, because you have rejected God's command, God has rejected you and the kingship, the kingdom, the monarchy has been taken from you. And will be conferred upon another. As it turns out, it's his son-in-law, King David. The tragedy was that between the capture of Agag and Samuel slaughtering him, Agag managed to impregnate a woman. And therefore the seed of Haman of Amboli continued. And Haman is a direct descendant of Agag. So what's the point? The point I'm saying is that Saul was the tribe of Benjamin and Mordechai was the, and Esther were the, from the tribe of Benjamin. So the story is the, the combatants are confronting each other again. The story of Purim, which happens much later after the story of King Saul, so there's three stories. Is the original attack in the desert, then another great confrontation with King Saul, which failed, and the confrontation with Mordechai, Esther, and Haman, which we are still to continue that battle till Mashiach comes. But again, not on a physical level, because we cannot for certain identify who is a descendant of Amalek or not. That's one thing that Mashiach will do. And how he's going to do it, we don't know exactly, because all the messianic prophecies um, are very nebula and can be manifested many ways. So, for example, one of the prophecies is the great war of Gog and Magog, which is described in horrific detail in, in scripture. We read the story in the Torah on Cholam Oitzukas. The great Hasidic sages said that that's not going to happen literally. It has already happened on a spiritual level. And for that matter, there was tremendous, some say the Second World War was part of that, others say not. But, but at any rate, um, it's not going to be this wholesale destruction global destruction described in their prophecy. All I'm saying is that, that how exactly will Amalek be destroyed by Mashiach? It's not as simple as a, a physical war. But one thing is certain, the spiritual war, that's the critical war. The critical war that each and every one of us needs to engage in. In other words, I'm saying as follows. Why are we even remembering this mitzvot, what Amalek did, and the mitzvot to wipe him out? And we don't even know who it is. It's a moot point. He was, he is, we don't know who it is. And Mashiach will take care of it. Answer, because spiritually, on the contrary, the main war is a spiritual war, a war within. What is Amalek within? Let's have a look. Now look at the text. We're now going to explain the spiritual Amalek. So if you see the text I sent you, Let's have a look at it together. We look at the second one first. It's as you can see from Devarim, it's from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter Chafe, verses 17 and 18. You design, you dress, Parshish Kiseitse, Parshish Kiseitse, which we're going to read tomorrow in Shul. We're going to read this quote. 
The quote says, you can see it in the middle of the text, Zohar remember, which Amalek did to you, he encountered you on the way when you left Egypt and he attacked you and he captured the stragglers, actually it was one, maidservant and so on. Now you'll notice that the word Korcha, he encountered you, is in bold. Why? Because this term, he encountered you. What does the Torah mean by that? He attacked you. The Torah could have simply said, remember what Amalek did? He attacked you when you left Egypt. Simple, straightforward. What does it mean he encountered you? Ashekorcha. So Hasidus explained is a very, very deep message here. In Hebrew, friends, the word for cold, cold is kar. Kufresh, the root letters of this word. And the karer in modern Hebrew is a frigidaire. The word kar means cold. So what's the meaning here? He made you cold. You. He cooled your ardor. What does this mean? It means, friends, the insidiousness of Amalek, which is the root, the root of all evil that needs to be eradicated is, and it's very subtle and surprising, our ardor being cooled. It doesn't tell you don't do, keep Shabbos, don't put on tefillin, don't do mitzvahs. It doesn't have the audacity, at least at the outset, to come along to a Jew. We're talking about the Amalek within. The Yitzhara, the evil inclination, and tell a person outright sin, and then worship idols. How does, what guise, what form does he come? How does he seduce the Jew, ensnare him? He calls his ardor. Why are you so excited and passionate? How does he do that? And look at the next quote on the page. A little bit of arithmetic, which I'm very poor, you're going to add up the numbers. As you all know, every Hebrew word is a number. So Amalek, let's add it up. Amalek is 70, Ayin is 70, Mem is 40, Lambert is 30, and Kuf is 100. No, do the math, fellas. Save me, help me out here. What's 70 and 40 and 30 and 100? What you calculate? 240, correct. Now another Hebrew word, safek. Safek means a doubt. Let's add up the Hebrew. Let's add up the numerical value of that word. Samach is 60. And pay is 80 and kufa is 100. Again, the, the kufa appears in both words. So 60 and 80 and 100, Same thing. 240. Now there's no accidents in Torah. This is, Torah is the language of God. It's a divine language. It has infinite and endless meanings. If two words share the same numerical value, that means on some deep level they're connected. Let me give you another example. It's a kind of a Purim example. Wine. Wine. Yayin. Let's add up the numerical value of the word yayin. Yud is 10. Yud is 10 again. And nun is 50. Even I can figure that out. So 10 and 10 and 50. 70. Another Hebrew word, sod. Sod means a secret. Samach is 60, and Vav is 6, that's 66, and Dalit is 4, 70. So wine and secret share the same numerical value. We can see the connection. The wine goes in, secrets come out. And also, on a very practical level, how is the wine produced? By extracting the juice that's concealed within. Look at the grape, you don't see the, the juice, you got to take it out. So wine is literally physically made by extracting the juice, but then its, it's effect on the person is, in the words of our sage, sages, nichnas yain, the wine goes in, yetzisod, the secrets come out. Now, all this, I'm just illustrating that if two words share the same numerical value, you probe deeper, there's always a connection, it's not by accident. And this is a whole, by the way, a whole strata all oh, entire books are written on numerical values and, and deep messages contained by verses and words that share the same numerical value. I have a cousin, in fact, 
have a cousin, Nechama's cousin, who has been working for this on years, and he has friends, thousands, of extraordinary, he has, to, he has to publish it, thousands of extraordinary examples of numerical value, comparisons and messages. He's devoted himself to this study. Now, what's the point over here? What is the connection between doubt and Amalek and coldness? So friends, listen very deeply. Amalek, how does he cool us? He met you, korcha, which means he cooled you because he casts doubt. Now, what kind of doubt does he cast? Not simply a doubt, is there a God or not a God? It's not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it for most people and for the objective thinker. You look at the world, you see the design, the designer. It's the most obvious conclusion. Children know there's a God. So what, what doubt does he seek to poison us with? You know what the doubt is? The doubt is, what difference do I make? Doubting ourselves. Now, Moloch is very insidious. And the doubt is rooted. It's an exploitation of actual belief in God. How so? Moloch says, God is so great. God is infinite. God is eternal. In the face of the infinite eternal God, does anything really make a difference at the end of the day? And certainly you. That's what Amalek is saying. And that's why he cools the ardor. A Jew will believe, yes, if I do mitzvahs, I get rewarded in the hereafter. All true. Fine. But how much reward do I need? Does it really make a difference? Does the great eternal God really care? Well, the world, does it make a difference to the world if in the details of my life, I'm, I, I'm particular about the kashras, if I don't, Keep Shabbos that way if I miss a mincha, whatever, each one on their level, each one on our level. He doesn't say don't do it. He just says, but really, in the big picture, does it make a difference? Does it make a difference to God? No. He's infinite. Make a difference to the world. I'm a little person. So he cools the outer, he cools the significance. And this, friends, is the most insidious the most insidious attack on the core of our being and the purpose of creation. Haman is a great rationalist. The truth is, logically, he is right. In the face of the infinite, of the infinite God of eternity, I'm less than a speck in the universe. We all are. Now, before I go to where he's wrong and so deeply, and what's the answer to Amalek? We just understand that Haman argued the same thing. Haman, Megillah, listen to this, it's an amazing thing. Megillah tells us that Haman erected a gallows to hang Mordechai, the Jew. The Megillah tells us how tall the gallows was. It was 50 cubits high. Do so you have to know exactly how tall it was? For all time, it's recorded, it was 50 cubits high, and it's mentioned not once, but twice in the Megillah. Once when he builds it, and the second time when he's hung upon it. He's hung upon the gallows 50 cubits high that he had made from Mordechai. It's a detail that doesn't seem relevant. Answer. Very deep message here. 50, friends, represents the infinite. Why? Because seven represents nature. The world's created in seven days. Seven represents the seven divine attributes in heaven. Chesed, kindness, gevura, judgment. There are seven attributes. Now, all the attributes are interwoven. So the seven times seven is 49. 49, therefore, represents the divine system of morality, of justice, of right, of wrong. But Haman argued that's all a mask on you. You, represented by the level 50, you, God, are infinite. You don't and cannot care because you're eternal and infinite. I know. That for us, you do a mitzvah, you get rewarded, you sin, you punish. It's all true. I'm not arguing that. But does it make a real difference? He argued, show your true face. 
let me get away with this because not only you don't care, you cannot care whether I ha hang or Mordechai hangs, the whole world goes up in smoke because you are the infinite God that nothing can make a difference to you. I'm changing your eternal. He exploits and argues the greatness of God to his end, which is the insignificance of all life, ultimately. And rationally, he's right. And that's in, you think, to the 50th, he wants to hang him on the 50th level, which is symbolic of the infinite at that level. Me and Mordechai are equally insignificant, which is why the numerical value, well, we have time to add it up now, but the numerical value of curse be Haman and bless be Mordechai is the same. The same numerical value that's conveying his message, all is equal before God. And that's why the lottery throws a lottery. Purim means a lottery. That's what it means in Persian. Why are we calling it Purim? He, he threw a lottery to determine what day to destroy the Jews. It's such an insignificant detail in the story. What's the difference how he threw, how he determined it? And he, because it was his wife's birthday or any other day. Why is the lottery Purim? So that's the name of the Yom Tov because that's what he's saying. Lot, what does a lottery mean? Could be this way, could be that way. A lottery chooses the, the result and choice is not because of the value of one over the other. It's just random. And he's saying that all life is equally insignificant. Me, Haman, it's all, Mordechai, it's all the same. That's what I'm like. He wants doubt. What value do you really have? What's the answer? The answer is Hashem is beyond the infinite. You're right. If God was the infinite God, then nothing makes a difference. He's beyond that. And he chooses to care. He chooses to care and to be affected. It does make a difference because he wants it to. And God has made himself vulnerable and is affected. And he has chosen because he wants to be part of my life. What does God want? Amalek says, who are you? You are nothing. And the answer is I am nothing. But God decided he wants me. And he wants you. And he wants to be part of my life. And that makes me everything. And this is the root, friends. This is the root of all failure. The root of all failure is the failure to realize that every human being counts. God is, wants to be part of the life of every Jew and every human being. And we need to inspire that message. It, life is not dispensable. And nobody can be used as a means for some other end. Every life is infinitely precious to God himself. Why? Because he chose it should be. Mortal man. I want to be part of your life, the way you eat, sleep, and drink. The small details of your life that you think, what difference does it make, says God. To me, they make all the difference. Why? Because I chose they should. And I chose. Did I have to? No, but I did. This is the great war. This is the ultimate war. The ultimate battle is which has to be eradicated. A monarch has to be eradicated. The ultimate battle is, and that's ambition as Jews, to make every human being, starting with the Jewish people on the planet, realize you are integral to the Almighty himself. You are the whole world. You are everything God wants to be part of the details of your life. Your morality, Haman argued morality is a convention. And compared to the infinite, it means nothing. No, God says, I choose, I want morality. And every life is everything to me. That is the answer to all of the ills of the world. Our children, friends. This is the most important message we need to convey to them. We, 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 this parish is by Yikra. We started the new book of the Torah. Yikra means, and God called to Moshe. God called him, Moshe. The Torah tells us our sages and Moshe was so humbled by this that God called me that he, that he wrote that word Vayikra, the last letter in Aleph, he wrote it small. He wrote it small. He just couldn't write it out fully. God called me in his great humility. 
Now, here's the amazing thing, friends. The, the custom is that a Jewish child, when they go to Cheder, before they learn even the other base, the first thing they read with the, with the Rebbe is this verse, Vayikra. It's the third book of the Torah. Then they go back and they start Bereshis from the beginning. Why not just start from the beginning in the first place? Why Vayikra and God called? Because this is the first message, message. Everybody has to know that God is calling you. Hashem himself is, I need you. God needs. How could a perfect God need? I chose to need and therefore I need. I need you. This is what our children need to know. Self-esteem, friends. If we don't have a healthy self-esteem, the root of our whole identity is is eroded. What's the self-esteem, friends? You're smart, you're clever, you're funny, you do well in school. That is a very dangerous self-esteem because if someone else is, is smarter, he's a threat to me. And, and, if they, my, and if I feel my parents love me because I'm cute, then the next door neighbor's kids are cuter. You'd rather have them, but you're stuck with me. That kind of praise and self-esteem is, is, self, is self, what's the word I'm looking for? Self-incriminating, self-destructive. You know what? No, 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 no. The self-esteem is Hashem created you and you are everything and the, and the neighbor's child is everything. We are all are everything to Hashem. No one's a threat. By Yikra, God is calling each one of you. Hashem needs your mitzvah, your little shema, your made the ani in the morning, your bracha over, your, over the cereal. This is everything to Hashem. Hashem is so happy. This is what Amalek wants to destroy. He wants, he wants to cool off our entire enthusiasm and ardor by placing the doubt. What difference does it really make? And it's a logical, rational doubt. Wrong. Makes all the difference. This is the great war. This is the great internal battle. This is the answer to all of the ills of the world. Is the essential value of every human being because Hashem wants you, has chosen you, each one of us. He wants to be part of our life. He wants us to perfect this world. He wants to make this world a home for him. That's the message. The most critical and fundamental message. All right, friends, go up. Really, we'll continue. One second. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Next Thursday, next Friday is what? Actually, I'm not going to be here. Next Friday, I'll be on a plane. Or at the airport, I'm going to Hashem. Next Shabbos is the Bas Mitzvah or Sunday of our granddaughter in Potomac Village. So it won't be a class next Friday. And Thursday is Purim. Somehow let's make up on Purim to connect somehow. We'll, we'll figure it out. A virtual Very Fabrengen good. or a physical Fabrengen. Actually, I'll tell you now, friends. Um, uh, Thursday, Purim. So I'll send you a WhatsApp to invite you. Um, Thursday afternoon from like two o'clock or so, I'm at home and everybody's invited to come by for a lachayim, to stay for a minute, for an hour, for two, for as long as you like, and to share some words and joy together. So I'll put that out there and invite everybody. So meal of a wonderful Shabbos, an inspiring Shabbos, and let's eradicate that amolek within, that sense of doubting our value. What difference do I make? That's, that's the core struggle. The answer is everything. Because Hashem wants me, and you, and you, my children, and every, every, every Jew and every human being on the planet. A wonderful Shabbos, everybody.